Hello, this is Mark Smith with Family Tree Counseling Associates, and I'm back this week to discuss an interesting topic called 13 Wicked But Invisible Dysfunctions. Uh, this past Friday was uh, Friday the 13th, so I thought I'd do something with 13 in the title just for fun. Um, there's a lot of discussion about adult children of alcoholics. It's sort of a, a movement, ACOA. I'm sure many of you are familiar with it. But as I was thinking this week, I believe that every human being on the planet actually qualifies as an adult child of an alcoholic. And not everybody's parent was alcoholic, but um, I think the broader meaning of that term is that uh, everybody grew up with a great deal of dysfunction. And it's not like uh, there's a small group of, or even a, a third of us who uh, grew up with alcoholics and then the rest of us had it easier. It's really not like that, folks. Everybody on the planet grew up with a great deal of dysfunction. I, I assure you that. Um, it, it may seem like a dark way of looking at the world. Um, we use family trees or genograms as a, a tool for our assessment, thus the name Family Tree Counseling where we simply ask about your parents and grandparents. And I've, I've done thousands of these. And I've never met anybody who grew up in a healthy home. My, my belief is on a scale of one to 10, uh, with 10 being perfectly healthy, of course, everyone agree would agree that there's no 10s. But I don't believe there's any 9s, 8s, or 7s anywhere on this planet. There might be a few sixes walking around. I think I met one one time. Most of us hover right around the national average, I would say, is, is about three on a scale of one to ten in terms of your emotional health. And I'm saying that's everybody. It's virtually everybody. There might be a few outliers who grew up in, you know, healthier homes, maybe fives or so, but uh, there are no sevens. So... Um, so I want to discuss what I run into a lot in doing these family trees because somebody will come in and their spouse will be clearly, highly, off the charts, crazy. <laughs> they are dysfunctional with a capital D. And then I say, well, tell me about your childhood. And they say, well, it was perfect. You know, mother was June Cleaver and... She vacuumed the carpet, carpet every day in a cocktail dress and a, and a string of pearls. Uh, and Daddy uh, was there for home for dinner every night, and they never fought, and they're married 50 years. No. No. Uh, <clears throat> Daddy might have been home. They, they very well might be married 50 years. But there are some subtle forms of dysfunction that are every bit as hurtful and destructive as if one of your parents was an alcoholic. Uh, neither one of my parents were alcoholic. I don't have any aunts or uncles or siblings who are alcoholics. It just doesn't run in our family. Uh, but trust me when I tell you my family is ever been as crazy as any alcoholic family on the planet. We have other more subtle addictions and dysfunctional behavior. And uh, I wanted to run through some of those because it'll explain why it seems like one side of the family is just, you know, stone cold, crazy nuts. And then the other side looks like the Waltons. And the truth is both sides are equally healthy or unhealthy. That is an immutable law of nature. So the first thing on my 13 wicked but invisible dis dysfunctions is enmeshment. And enmeshment 
is being too close, loving too much. And you might say, you can't love too much. Yeah, you can. If you center your life around a child as a parent, instead of centering your life around your marriage and yourself, uh, you're going to damage that child horribly. Because they're going to grow up with the impression that life centers around them, and it does not, as they'll find out when they deal with college professors and future bosses and future spouses. Um, enmeshment is uh, people that don't have boundaries. It's not okay to be an individual. It's not okay to have a voice. Uh, in the Bible, there's a verse of scripture. It says, a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. Well, that's a psychological process of leaving where you grow up and, and mom and daddy, you know, let go. And, and they raise the child to fly out of the nest and not hang out in the nest forever. And um, this is a tough one because it looks like a happy family. And, and they are happy. They're happy in their addiction of being addicted to each other and, and not really individuating and becoming their own people, their own families. Um, I had a fa family once that, uh, I mean, they, they vacationed together frequently. Uh, they had long Christmas breaks. But none of the, the children ever really psychologically separated from mom and dad. And they were happy in it when they were together. They just weren't able to live separate, individuated lives like grown-ups. So a, a second and related thing with enmeshment is uh, not being able to say no. We've all seen a a four-year-old throw a tantrum at Walmart or Target because they didn't get a toy and mom is left there in a bind you know she don't want to spank the kid in the store and get CPS called on her but she's mortified that he's and sometimes she'll buy him the toy because he's holding a gun to her head so to speak but that little boy will grow up in tantrum as an adult when he doesn't get what he wants and he'll be overly self-centered and self-destructive. The, the thing about enmeshment and lack of boundaries, many years ago, I had a family come in, and they were a lovely uh, Catholic family, saintly mother, nicest woman in the world. Uh, but they, they fit a, a typical pattern, and that was dad was busy working, and there were three boys who um, all had a presenting problem and they came in for these presenting problems of the boys. Uh, the first one had what I called a fatal attraction girlfriend. She, there was just all kinds of drama and uh, dysfunction and breakups and tears and it, it, I mean in high school you don't want that you don't want that ever but you certainly don't want it in high school second boy had uh, shoplifted and he had never done anything wrong in his life but the truth the truth was he uh, had a little larceny in him and um, but he never wanted to do anything wrong because he didn't want to upset his saintly mother the third boy was acting out uh, homosexually and I had to sit saintly mother down who had devoted her entire life to raising these boys because there wasn't much substance in her marriage because her husband wasn't really present. And I had to say with the first boy, there's too much intensity and closeness between you and your son and between the whole family uh, when dad is around and when he's not around. And so he's used to an intense relationship. And it's not healthy. Second boy, you know, same thing is is he could never be himself because he, he instead of being himself, he, he had always 
uh, focused on, I don't want to hurt mom. And then the third boy, and I know this isn't politically correct, but I, every uh, homosexual man I've ever known or worked with has been abandoned by his father. You will not meet a homosexual man who was very emotionally close to his father growing up. I assure you that. And um, everyone that I've ever known or worked with has been enmeshed with a woman, whether it be grandma or mom or a whole house full of women, but they, they just overly connect with them. And then during adolescence, because of these wounds and everybody's twisted up and everybody's sexuality, the root cause is their childhood emotional wounds, these little boys hunger for male love and attention and they over identify with the feminine and they did not choose to be gay. There's a lot of middle-aged Christian married men who don't want to be gay, but they're gay, you know. So, but it was all because Mama devoted too much of her time, focus, and energy to be super mom, making up for, she thought, what she didn't get, but she overcorrected in the other direction. A third of these 13 invisible dysfunctions is having too large of a family. Uh, and, you know, let's face it, a lot of it does, you know, you find it in Catholicism. Nothing against Catholicism. Sorry, I, I, I grew up as an altar boy. Um, but two people can't raise 11 people. That's insane. It's insane. It's worse than alcoholism. Uh, because the older ones don't get a childhood and they have to raise the younger ones and the middle ones get lost and then by the time the younger ones come along the parents are exhausted nobody gets what they need uh, I don't have to hear about any other dysfunction if I hear of a family with five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve thirteen kids I know they're insane I know it's a family full of broken, empty people. There is no other alternative. Um, and it, I, just, I just find it tragic that that would masquerade and be seen as something that's a good and healthy thing. It's not a good thing. It's not a healthy thing. It has brought so much human suffering into the world. Brought a lot of Catholics in the world, granted. But it's brought a lot of abandonment and emptiness and brokenness and dysfunction into the world because two people are in no way equipped. I think it's a stretch to have four children, but eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, uh, it's wickedly dysfunctional. The uh, third thing is, is uh, one, and, and I'll expand it in today's day and age. When I grew up, it was, it was television. My dad was a TV addict. We'd get up, we'd get up on Sunday morning, and he'd be planted in front of the TV, and he says, "It's an all-time biggie." <laughs> every every movie was an all-time biggie, and he would go on about uh, Gene Hackman and Clint Eastwood, and uh, he ha he thought Perry Como was a bum though. For some, I don't know what that's about, but uh. uh he was never present. And one time I, I discussed this with him during my one deep talk with him in my lifetime. And with tears in his eyes, he said, I really don't get much enjoyment out of life. Whatever enjoyment I get out of it, I get out of that box. And of course, nowadays, there are so many other things to be addicted to besides the television, you know, the internet, uh, computers. I, I think one of the one of, I think we're going to see a whole generation of people who basically were raised on crack cocaine called uh, iPads and little uh, Kindle Fires and the little tablets where uh, kids can tap, tap, tap all day long. And if you separate them from their tablet, they go into rage and they go into withdrawal. Um, but uh, people can sit and play games with friends all night long, or Facebook, or you know, uh, 
you know people like that, you might be like that yourself. So, um, another really overlooked dysfunction is moving too frequently. Um, if you grew up like I did in the Air Force, uh, then uh, I had to move every year and a half. And I was uh, uh, an introverted, shy kid who didn't make friends well. And it just, I never had any roots. I never had long-term friends until high school. And uh, that can just be very, it takes away something solid. You know, I've known people that, that uh, knew people since kindergarten and they never moved in their childhood and they knew everybody in the community. That's solid. But I, I was always the new kid and by new kid it meant weird kid. Who are you? We don't know you. you know. And then by the time you get a little foot in the door to, to be uh, accepted then you have to pick up and move again. Um, here's one. Uh, that maybe isn't quite as subtle, and that's uh, poverty. Um, being poor is a real dysfunctional thing um, because it really will affect your self-esteem. You're not going to feel very cool if you show up at school with, you know, uh, uncool clothes and everybody goes on vacation and you stay home uh, and your mom drives up in a crappy car um, and you don't have really cool toys to play with it makes you feel less than and little kids should not be worrying about whether or not there's enough money to pay the electrical bill or if there's enough money to buy food so um, poverty, um, I can't recommend it. It's very destructive. Um, here's another subtle one, and that's favoritism. Um, favoritism is so destructive. I've worked with so many families where the golden child gets spoiled, and then Cinderella or Cinderfella uh, go through life playing second fiddle, and they pick partners who constantly treat them like Cinderella and Cinderfella because their wound is for whatever reason mom and daddy liked you know Joe better uh, or you know uh, Mary was the princess um, this brings up a story from my childhood I had a sister, the oldest uh, daughter, the fourth child. Uh, I'm the second. She was the first girl, and my mother wanted to do something for her, and my mother bought her a canopy bed and matching furniture, but it would only fit in a certain room in our house. So I ended up in a room in a bunk bed with my little brother that was about a fifth the size as... It was really more of a more of a hallway slash closet, whereas my sister's room was five uh, times bigger and it had new furniture. And it was my mother trying to do something really indirectly for herself, but it made me feel bad. It it made me feel, you know, we called her Royal Renda, Royal Renda, um, because. It, it was clear that she had a status as the oldest girl that we would never achieve. Um, another subtle dysfunction is a controlling parent who has to have their finger in everything and things have to go their way and there's too much routine because they cannot go with the flow. Another one is of course workaholism. Just a parent who put in 60, 70, 80, 90, 100 hours a week. You cannot be present for yourself, your spouse, or your children if you're working that many hours. 
And people call it work ethic. No, it's workaholism. It's an addiction. It's, it's just as bad as alcoholism in terms of its effect on the family and on children. Another one is food addiction. In my family, um, there wasn't an overabundance of quality time or attention, but there were certain comfort foods that my mother would provide, and we would see it as love. Fudge was love. Stuffed green peppers were love. Um, uh, biscuits and gravy in the morning was a tangible form of love. So myself and all my siblings, we've all struggled, uh, as you can see, a little bit with weight because um, it's so drilled into us that if you want to feel better, you know, eat something. And it's hurtful to your health, but it's also an addiction just as bad as alcoholism. Um, the next one is families that grew up with horrific childhoods, clearly two and a halfs on a good day, but they get married young and then they masquerade as sevens on that mental health scale. They don't get divorced and there's this myth that we're healthy and the family's riddled with many of these 13 invisible dysfunctions and these people have to be crazy because their mother committed suicide, their father was an alcoholic, um, their father ran off and left them. But uh, through coping mechanisms and a whole lot of denial and myth making, they pretend we did it better, we escaped our childhood. Nobody escapes their childhood. They may masquerade and then their children will grow up and it'll look like the, dis the dysfunction skipped a generation, but it didn't. Um, uh, it just looks like, you know, there's an alcoholic, healthy family, alcoholic. No, there's three generations of dysfunction because somebody's lying, somebody's uh, burying their feelings. Uh, the last thing, I can't talk long, I'm running out of time, is uh, religious addiction, or the next to the last one people who are addicted to religion. That was my number one addiction from age 17 to about 33. I was stoned on Jesus and, and I needed that because uh, the world seemed like too complex of a place without that uh, blankie for me. And the last thing, of course, is, is abandonment issues uh, where there was some kind of interference with the connection between a mother and a baby, or if early death pulls a parent away, or if a, if a dad just checks out and moves, you know, to another state or whatever and just disconnects. So, so those are 13 wicked but invisible dysfunctions that I think you'll agree that almost every family has three or four of them. Um, it's very common. So thank you for watching. Please join or subscribe to our channel, Family Tree Counseling, on YouTube, and visit our website, FamilyTreeCounseling.com. We have tons and tons and tons of blogs and articles and podcasts and videos talking about the recovery process. There are also our five ebooks on various subjects like abandonment and a fair recovery, and I have a new one coming out supposedly in January. The holidays, are, holidays have kept me busy and I, and I haven't been finishing it, but uh, uh, probably more toward late January now. So thank you very much for watching the video and uh, God bless.